All right, hello and good morning, everyone. Welcome to the Serving Immigrant Communities webinar. My name is Courtney Allison, and I'm the Southeast Regional Coordinator from the Indiana State Library's Professional Development Office. I'll be the host and question moderator for today. Our presenters this morning are Terry Downs, Executive Director of the Immigrant Welcome Center, and Angela Adams, Immigration Attorney. I'd like to start off the webinar with a few announcements. This webinar is provided as a part of the Library Trends and Hot Topics series. To register for other webinars available for this theme or other trainings available from the Professional Development Office, please see the Indiana State Library's events calendar, which can be found at our website, www.in.gov library. For a full list of our current in-person training menu, please see our continuing education website. The Indiana State Library has many ways we try to stay connected to library staff across the state. For weekly updates on upcoming trainings and to learn more about what's happening in libraries across the state, please subscribe to our weekly e-newsletter, The Wednesday Word. We also offer a blog which provides information about the Indiana State Collection, interview spotlights on library staff from across the state, and information about upcoming events at the Indiana State Library. If you have a question, just type it in the chat box on the upper left side of the screen, and I'll be watching and get your questions to Terry and Angela as soon as there's a good opportunity. There should also be time near the end for questions. This session is one hour, so you'll get one LEU for today. You'll be able to download your LEU at the end of this presentation, so please stay signed in until the end to get your LEU. I'll also be putting a link to a survey at the end of the presentation. Please click on the link and let us know how we're doing. If at any point during the webinar you experience any sound issues, please see the sound issues box just below the chat box on the left side of the screen. If there's a global sound issue, we will announce it in the chat pod. If you are unable to resolve the sound issues you are experiencing, we are recording the meeting and you can watch it offline after the meeting has ended. Again, if there is a global sound issue, we will make an announcement in the chat box. Without further ado, I turn it over to Terry and Angela. Good morning, everyone. Uh, this is Terry Morris Downs, and I am Executive Director of the Immigrant Welcome Center. We're very happy to be participating in this today and uh, looking forward to talking to you about um, all the things that we do at the Immigrant Welcome Center and also um, some of the issues surrounding immigrants right now in um, throughout the state and uh, nation. So um, I always start with the big picture of immigrants, and um, many of my statistics are um, local from um, Marion County, and I realize this is a statewide association, um, but we have seen immigrant growth throughout the state. I do have a, a slide where we'll go over some of the economic impact that immigrants are making in the state. But this just kind of shows you how uh, diverse Indianapolis has become. Uh, you can see that 10% of our uh, population speak a, a language other than English at home. And our foreign-born population in Marion County has grown to an all-time high of 8.5%. I know that is true also, uh, right at 8.5% in Hamilton County. And so um, in absolute numbers, this is the um, highest number of immigrants in these counties um, that have that we've ever uh, experienced, 49% uh, of new arrivals um, and new arrivals being people since 2000 do not have anyone older than 14 years of age at home who speak English fluently. And I'm sure in some of the libraries where you're serving immigrants, you also see how children many times are asked to be the interpreters or translators for their parents. And um, we have seen an enormous um, population growth in the foreign born throughout the state of Indiana from the years 2000 to 2013. Our foreign born population has grown about 62%. Um, in Marion County, we have seen a 42% increase between the years 2000 and 2011. Um, and many believe that the numbers that you see in the bar chart are actually quite underrepresented because of the number of uh, foreign-born people who do not answer the census. Uh, these numbers, uh, by the way, have been updated each year through the um, uh, 2010 U.S. Census and then updated uh, annually through the American Community Survey. 
um, on the bar chart to the lower left of your screen, you'll see that um, uh, Marion County's foreign-born population is projected to be close to 119,000 individuals by the year 2023, and that we will be uh, have a minority majority in Marion County by the year 2025. Again, speaking of um, how uh, multicultural and multi-ethnic uh, Indianapolis um, and other um, municipalities throughout in, uh, the state of Indiana have become in the past 20 years. This is the um, this is the economic impact that uh, new Americans are making throughout the state of Indiana. I won't go over all of this uh, for lack of time, but uh, take a look at that when uh, when you have time, and you will see just how our uh, statewide economy depends on immigrants and refugees as entrepreneurs, as um, consumers, as home buyers, as um, taxpayers. And so this is very, um, this is a, a, a something seen throughout the United States and Angela Adams, the immigration attorney I'm with today, will also um, talk about how so many um, uh, cities, towns, and states are um, really increasing their efforts to lure immigrants and refugees into their communities because of the economic impact uh, they are making um, in these in these communities. Uh, again, we're going back to our uh, local data that shows that um, we have uh, a very diverse population in Indianapolis, with Mexico by far and away being the number one country of origin for our immigrants here, uh, followed by Burma um, as uh, refugees. Indianapolis um, has the largest Burmese population outside of the country of Burma or Myanmar. And uh, Fort Wayne also has a very, very large uh, population um, of Burmese and has the largest per capita population of Burmese refugees as anywhere in the country. We also have a number of immigrants from China India and Germany located in Indianapolis. Um, and at the Immigrant Welcome Center, we are most usually um, asked for assistance from immigrants or refugees in finding employment opportunities or job training opportunities, legal assistance, and Angela in a moment will talk about what some of the legal needs have been of immigrants uh, recently. Uh, financial basic needs, ESL and educational opportunities, and what we call cultural literacy is when we are asked to provide to service providers or others uh, language or cultural um, information on uh, from social service agencies, government agencies, libraries, so that they know that they are working um, in a culturally sensitive manner with people that they are serving from those countries. So we get a lot of those, and I'll tell you in just a moment about how we uh, how we work at the Immigrant Welcome Center. So our mission is really to help empower immigrants by connecting them to the people, places, and resources that enable them to build successful lives and enrich our community. And uh, we do that through several programs that I will highlight briefly so that uh, we have time to answer questions uh, as well as talk about the legal needs of immigrants in our communities right now. Uh, our core program is the Natural Helpers Program, and we have uh, trained hundreds and hundreds of um, immigrants and refugees as uh, volunteers since we began the program in 2006. Uh, right now, we have 128 natural helpers who are serving um, as volunteers, and they represent 66 different languages and 47 different countries of origin, all located right here in central Indiana. So you can see just how diverse Indianapolis has truly become. The Natural Helpers Program is uh, very unique in how it provides one-on-one -on -one support 
for immigrants and refugees from someone who has personally experienced the integration process of coming into a new country and needing assistance in with uh, significant language or cultural barriers. And so um, we uh, train them extensively to be able to understand how to work with newcomers to build self-sufficiency in the United States, as well as to understand all of the community resources that are available to help families and to empower them to build successful lives here in the United States. So the infographic at the bottom of your screen shows that we receive um, uh, inquiries from immigrants or refugees through telephone calls, visitors, through the natural helpers themselves. Um, you know, if it's something basic, like I'm looking for an ESL class or uh, what job opportunities are available in Indianapolis right now, we handle those with our staff. We do have about three, or actually four languages uh, that we can help immigrants in in our uh, from our staff, but if it's something more cultural, where they would like something explained um, in in their own language, or where they are trying to build social supports, um, or a family is in crisis, we will then uh, employ the the natural helpers to be able to help with that particular need. And so we will match them based upon their language or cultural uh, or uh, country of origin um, and uh, determine who the best fit might be for that. In that case, the natural helper works with them to help them establish social connections, understand how things work. We'll work with them one-on-one -on -one in um, acculturating them to how things work in Indianapolis or in the United States and help them to, you know, navigate those resources that are available to help with any particular need. Um, again, we just, um, we have many uh, different cultures, and um, this slide uh, explains how integral uh, the natural helpers are in the delivery of services uh, through the Immigrant Welcome Center. Uh, in 2016, we had 120 natural helpers who served 2,200 immigrants and um, volunteered nearly 7,800 hours of volunteer time in um, meeting the needs of newcomer immigrants and refugees in Indianapolis. Uh, we also have a monthly integration class that we call the Rubin Educational Series, named after Albert and Sarah Rubin. Uh, and um, we do uh, several uh, different cross-cultural topics to help uh, immigrants understand how things work in the United States. So you can see we do a number of topics such as understanding what your rights are as an employee in the United States, how to start a small business, naturalization and the green card process, how to file your taxes, um, job training opportunities. Um, we have focused mainly on their legal rights um, this year in making sure that immigrants understand what their constitutional rights are in the United States because so many newcomers believe that they have no rights in the United States since they are not citizens. And so we have done a number of outreach programs to help them understand what those are, and Angela will talk about that um, very shortly. We also started in 2013 branches in neighborhoods around Indianapolis so that we are able to um, work with um, individuals in their own neighborhoods um, in a culturally sensitive manner. In this case, we pay natural helpers as part-time employees to be in community centers and schools so that uh, at a desk so that people can come in and um, get the help that they need. Uh, we have a branch open um, and we operate these branches for about three hours a week at Hawthorne Community Center on uh, Thursday evenings at the IPS Newcomer School um, on um, Wednesday afternoons 
Shalom Healthcare Center on uh, Tuesday afternoons. And then we also have uh, what we call pop-up branches when we know of new ESL classes that are starting uh, through the um, Indianapolis school districts and some of the charter schools that work in adult basic education. So we will go in with staff and natural helpers to be able to do client intakes for the first couple weeks of a, a new ESL class. I'm also really pleased to be able to tell you about a brand new partnership with the Indianapolis Public Library that we started uh, just about a month ago. And um, through the Public Library's Library Fund of the Central Indiana Community Foundation, they were able to offer grant support to uh, pay natural helpers to be in their branches as um, they're actually Immigrant Welcome Center employees, but they're also cross-trained to be able to help immigrants understand library services. So they have received training from both the Indianapolis Public Library as well as the Immigrant Welcome Center. And we are operating these six hours a week in two uh, Indianapolis branches that have a very large population of immigrants uh, that uh, patronize those branches. And so we have one up at the Pike Branch on Thursday afternoons as well as Saturday mornings and one at the East Washington Street Branch on Tuesday evenings and Saturday mornings. We will be um, uh, doing this for the next couple of years and continuing to add branches and languages. And we, um, both the Public Library and the Immigrant Welcome Center are very hopeful that um, this will lead to more immigrants utilizing library services uh, so that we, so that they understand and feel very welcome um, in public library branches. Uh, we also started a, a program as an affiliate of a national organization called Welcoming America, and we run a project called Welcoming Indianapolis. This is a way that we are able to speak to the native-born community about the benefits that immigrants bring into our communities and neighborhoods. And so we... Um, we work with lots of different community partners in putting together um, events and activities that will bring people of different cultures together so that they begin to um, um, foster inclusiveness and um, understand that, you know, we all have the same hopes and dreams. And um, it's a wonderful way that we begin to see the commonalities um, of our human family rather than seeing someone and, um, you know, greeting them with a suspicion or doubt or thinking that they don't speak the language or uh, I won't be able to communicate with them um, in any meaningful way. So it's also been a way that we've been able to work with neighborhoods that have had large influxes of um, immigrants moving into their neighborhood when there were some cultural barriers between neighbors not understanding why their new neighbors were doing this or don't they know what the covenants are of our neighborhood association and and trying to help fill in those um, cultural gaps that uh, that existed so that we are able to uh, build community and um, where everyone feels very welcomed and respected. So we also participate and uh, sponsor an annual event called Welcoming Week. This is a national event that is held in mid-September of each year. And we are responsible for the uh, local activities. And um, we work uh, with, again, with many community partners, including the public library, and doing lunch and learns on, um, on newer populations here. We did a very popular one last year um, explaining the Syrian refugee crisis and helping people to meet some of the local Syrian refugees. That was very, very well received. We had uh, another one with the Mexican consulate. Uh, last year uh, talking about the economic impact that Mexican-Americans are making in our city. 
Uh, and then we also worked uh, last year on an immigrant integration plan, which is really a citywide uh, plan making recommendations not just to the city of Indianapolis, but to all the community about ways that Indianapolis can and should become more immigrant friendly. And we are putting the finishing touches on that this week. And uh, we will soon be presenting that to Mayor Hogsett in a uh, press conference. So uh, be looking for that as well. Um, now I would like to turn it over to Angela Adams, who is an immigration attorney with Adams Immigration. And she will talk a little bit more about um, the uh, changes uh, since the Trump administration took office and the changes uh, for many immigrant families. Angela? Thank you, Terry. Um, and good morning, everyone. Uh, thank you for being with us and for being interested in this topic. Um, I would like to begin just with a brief summary of the executive orders since the Trump administration has come into office and what that has meant, uh, the impact that that has had on the community as a whole at large and then most specifically with the immigrant community. Terry and I have been literally on a uh, road tour, if you will, of um, different presentations at churches and community organizations, places of worship, et cetera, et cetera, uh, not just for immigrant um, community, but for also uh, the native born who are very interested and aware, more aware now than before um, about and, and wanting to talk about, learn about um, immigration in general. So that's something that we're doing frequently. The executive orders, uh, the first two were on January 26th, and you're probably familiar with the first one. Uh, actually, both of them really dealt with more of enforcement, increasing enforcement exterior on the exterior and on the interior and on the border. Um, so they talked about building the wall, uh, talked about um, expedited removal for folks uh, when they would not be have the right to a hearing before an immigration judge, um, talked about the priorities, uh, priority enforcement of those with criminal convictions um, or abusive programs. Um, and so we saw that as kind of more of an agenda setting and really looking at um, some of the promises that were made during the campaign and then putting them into writing, uh, but not necessarily having them being implemented overnight because many of these things that were called for actually require congressional action or funds. Um, so they can't just be done overnight, but it was somewhat of a statement of where the Trump administration intends to go. Um, the third executive order was actually on, I believe it was January 27th, was the first one that dealt with the travel ban. But as you all probably know, that, that um, the rollout was not as smooth as the administration would have hoped. And so they rewrote the order, and it was released and signed on March 6, 2017. What that did was ban all refugee admissions for 120 days, no new immigrants from Somalia, Syria, Sudan, Libya, Yemen, or Iran for the next 90 days. However, that executive order is, has been put on hold, and we are still waiting to hear what the court will decide. Um, it's been blocked by a temporary restraining order, and uh, we have yet to see what will happen with, with that executive order. So the effect of these executive orders that they had, and at the time I was working at Indiana University and had the firsthand experience of seeing not just the DACA or deferred action students that were afraid about the first two executive orders, but then the third executive order dealing with the, the predominantly Muslim countries, and many of the international students that were here on student visas became very afraid, and they were confused, and they were anxious, and they didn't know if they could travel because people were hearing all kinds of stories about even people who were on lawful visas or lawful permanent residents that were not able to return to the United States, people who were even naturalized citizens from these countries became afraid to travel. 
um, to, and to return to the United States. So we started talking about, you know, what the executive orders meant, really what their impact was, and then also knowing your rights. As Terry mentioned, it's very important to uh, explain to folks that they do, in fact, have rights, regardless of whether they are naturalized citizens, natural born citizens, or lawful permanent residents, or even if you're not, if you don't have lawful immigration status in the United States, you still have basic constitutional rights. So we are recommending that people consult with an immigration attorney, and very important to note, um, immigration law is very complicated. It's much like uh, tax law, very uh, driven by federal regulations, um, and very important that that people speak to someone who's qualified in immigration, who has experience and knowledge of the immigration laws. There are, unfortunately, we've heard many incidents of people that have been preyed upon by um, non-attorneys in the community, folks that maybe even mean well or are well-intended, they are just trying to help, but yet they cross the line of what is giving legal advice having non, not being a licensed attorney. So people need to be very, very careful. There's also something called a notario, or in English, a notary public. A notary, as you all know, a notary is someone that can really ba basically verify someone's identity and stamp and seal that to say that they are who they say they are. Um, but in Latin Amer many Latin American countries, uh, a notary to people also means that that person is known as an attorney. And that's not the case in the United States. And so we're trying to educate people, be very careful. If someone's advertising that they're a notario, it doesn't mean that they know immigration law. It doesn't mean that they can help you or give you legal advice or tax advice, things like that. There are folks out there that have gotten taken uh, and, and paid a lot of money to non-attorneys, even folks that are, not, that are not attorneys that are being supervised by attorneys, but because, you know, of the complicated nature of immigration, um, have led them down the wrong path. So we also are advising folks to prepare a safety plan in the case of arrest, detention, or deportation. Um, a lot of it right now is, is fear-based, um, even if it's not that much different. The, the landscape right now is not terribly different than what we've seen in the last eight years under the Obama administration, um, there were record numbers of deportations. And um, this is just kind of a different uh, focus, more attention given to the issue. Um, so folks are afraid. So we're trying to help people to be prepared. In, the, in any kind of emergency situation, you need to have a safety plan. You need to have a plan for your children so that your children, if they're US citizens, are not taken by Child Protective Services and that someone has been designated as a standby guardian in the case that a triggering event might happen, this person would be able to care for the children for a temporary period of time while they're tying up their affairs or figuring out where the children are to join the parents. Um, also, we're advising folks to um, go ahead and if the children are US citizens, um, but have access or, or parents are not U.S. citizens, they may be eligible for uh, dual nationality. And to establish that now so that in the case of something were to happen, the children would have the ability to then go live in the other country of the uh, country of origin of the parents. Um, the basic rights, just to kind of boil it down, I like to say that, uh, talk about five rights. Um, whether you're Regardless of your immigration status, you have the right to remain silent. You do not need to self-incriminate or, or um, answer questions that you have not been advised first by an attorney. Um, I always also say that that does not mean you have the right to be rude. So be very, very careful. You remain silent, um, but you don't. You, you remain polite and you remain. Uh, cooperative and you provide identification uh, at a minimum and then other than that you have a right to speak to a lawyer that second bullet down and you can assert that or third bullet down you can assert that right at any time and say I'm sorry I I don't want to continue to answer questions until I speak to my attorney and that means you need to have the name and phone number of a good attorney on your phone or 
or in your wallet so that you can contact that person immediately or that your spouse or loved ones can contact that person. You also have the right to see a search warrant if someone uh, stops you, uh, whether it's on the street or in your car or in your home or at your place of employment. Uh, typically, they have to have probable cause, which is a reason, or they have to have reason to believe that you're doing something illegal in order to enter or in order to search your person or your car. But in the case of your home, they have to have a search warrant. And so if someone comes to the door, you don't have to answer that door unless they have a search warrant. You also have the right to make a phone call. I usually add on here, um, you most people, not all, have the right to a hearing or what's called due process of law under the Constitution, um, a right to a hearing. And in this situation, it would be before an immigration judge. Um, kind of similar to criminal law, but not. It, immigration is not criminal law. It's before an administration, administrative law judge, and our jurisdiction is that of Chicago. And so if you're caught, if you're detained, if you are released on bond, typically you're going to have the right or be put in proceedings so that you may go before an immigration judge. You won't have that right if you have a prior order of removal, if you've been deported previously, um, or um, if you have committed certain crimes that make you subject to expedited removal. So where, you, where might you see an immigration officer or law enforcement officer, home, car, public place, or place of employment even? Um, and we kind of talked about that this already, but um, if they have good reason to think that there's a crime being committed, um, then they could stop the car. They saw a traffic offense being committed. Um, but uh, in a public place or in a place of employment, um, again, they would have to have some reason to believe or suspicion or something like that. And in the case of the home or place of employment, usually a warrant. In a public place, officers may approach you to ask questions at any time. You do not need to provide your name or address unless the officer believes you committed a crime or offense in Indiana. Um, however, I again would remind folks that don't be argumentative. It's always best to give your name and don't provide false information. Uh, to make an arrest on the street without a warrant, an officer must believe that you have committed a crime. What about at work? If you um, see immigration enforcement, immigration customs enforcement at a workplace, usually they have to have a warrant or the employer's permission. Sometimes there's two different types of ICE. ICE detention and removal is different than ICE Office of Investigations. Office of Investigations is the group that would conduct an audit to find out if there are folks that are uh, maybe working without proper employment authorization at that workplace. Um, that may be an audit for the employer. They may not be there to arrest individuals. ICE detention and removal would be there to, in fact, detain that exactly what it says, detention and removal, detain and then put in people into proceedings. But even so, you shouldn't panic, you shouldn't run away. We tell people don't hide. It's the worst thing you can do. And you still have constitutional rights. Um, and even if you do get into re removal proceedings, you might still have some kind of relief from removal. So there may be eligibility to seek some kind of stay of removal or some kind of what's called cancellation of removal if you meet certain criteria. So getting into removal proceedings may not be the end of the road. It actually might be the beginning of an opportunity for some folks. So what about a family safety plan? Uh, Terry and I uh, have been working closely with the Coalition for Our Immigrant Neighbors, COIN, and we've been working on um, doing some emergency safety plan clinics where folks can get um, free legal advice from a qualified attorney, either a family law attorney or an immigration attorney so that they can make their safety plan um, and have that available. We, we suggest that people memorize numbers of two emergency contacts because if you, something happens, you may not have access to your phone. You need to memorize phone numbers. Also, always good to have a power of attorney in place that's triggered by an event if something were to happen, whether you get detained, whether you're, um, uh, something happens and you're incapacitated, or um, someone passes away. You need to have 
your affairs in control of someone else. Temporary guardianship of U.S. citizen children. You need to find a trusted and documented individual to watch your child in the event of an emergency. And we suggest getting their passports now um, getting and obtaining their dual citizenship. Also, keep all important paperwork in a safe place. This sounds like common sense, but so many people, uh, including myself, I think, <laughs> may not be able to locate our important papers if something were to happen. And so uh, make sure you know where those are. Make a list of important information. Um, get those documents in order that prove that you've been here for 10 years or prove that you've paid your taxes. Have them all in a place that you can provide to an attorney in case something happens. If you have legal status, I would recommend that you carry proof of that status. I don't recommend that you carry your passport, your actual passport on you, because if you lose it, that's such a you know uh, an issue. But maybe carry a copy of it. Uh, maybe put a copy in your car, put a copy in your wallet, uh, put a copy at home, um, have a copy of your green card or a copy of a document that shows that you're in process to be getting a green card or that, you're, that you've got an approval notice somewhere, something on file with USCIS. So that concludes the immigration law. We also do what we call Immigration 101. I, I basically scratched the surface today of with the executive orders and kind of current events, but immigration, as I said, is a very complicated subject. We do, and we are able to go into great detail about um, different immigration categories uh, of visa classifications and employment-based immigration, family-based immigration, different options and things like that, um, why people can't, why, why someone might not be able to fix their lawful immigration status or why I, say, I usually say why can't they just get legal, which is a question that we hear a lot. Um, we're able to do presentations like that. Please feel free to invite us. I'm going to turn it back over to Terry to go over uh, one of my favorite things that the Immigrant Welcome Center has put together, 20 ways to welcome in your community. Uh, in response to the outpouring of um, individuals who really wanted to start engaging in helping uh, keep uh, the United States of America very diverse and wanted to show their personal support uh, for immigrants and refugees in the Hoosier State. Uh, we put together uh, with our partners at Welcoming America and just um, others um, about 20 different ideas on how you can uh, be more welcoming individually and how collectively as communities can be more welcoming. Uh, this, uh, this will be sent to all participants uh, separately in a uh, PDF format and you are very welcome to uh, take any of the ideas, um, you know, uh, personalize those into your own local communities and um, spread those uh, through your libraries because it's so important for all of us native-born Americans to be able to exercise our voices, um, not just politically, but to say immigrants are welcome here. And it goes so far right now because so many of our uh, foreign-born newcomers um, in Indiana right now think, um, I'm no longer welcome here, or um, America isn't as friendly as I thought it would be. And so it's so important for all of us to raise our voices and do things that show that we are still a nation of immigrants and that we still welcome everyone who comes here to um, find success and to build successful lives, not just for themselves, but for their children and generations to come. So I have a question here. Um, someone says, a lot of libraries can't take a political stand because it's important for us to be seen as being neutral. What's the best way to support our immigrant pa patrons without being seen as being political? 
Well, we um, it's not so much a, a political issue. Of course, I understand the concern in saying, you know, well, I can't, um, as a, an employee of the library, encourage people to contact our elected officials in Washington to ask them to do things. But you can certainly do things as an individual United States citizen to um, tell your elected of officials how you feel on these particular issues. So if you um, if you would rather um, you know come up with other ways that you can welcome in your uh, local community and take off some of those more political points, uh, by all means, think about other ways um, that you could be more welcoming there. Maybe uh, I, I again I applaud the Indianapolis Public Library and everything that they are doing to make. Um, the uh, local branch, a very welcoming place for immigrants, and several of them have started conversation circles, and it's been a great way to be able to help newcomers practice their English skills and bring in people who want to be able to um, help help newcomers be successful. And it brings together people of different cultures in a way that, uh, you know, they just reserve a room for an hour every Tuesday night and people come in and it's just a conversation circle. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, those kind of things aren't on this list, but are really easy for all sorts of public library branches to be able to uh, welcome um, immigrants and refugees into their neighborhoods and their, and their local branches. And can I add one more thing? I think uh, I think that's really important because libraries, for me, when I go into my local my local branch, I am so happy to see such diversity in so many different faces and ages. Um, I think libraries are such are viewed as a safe place. They are viewed as a convener. They are viewed as a place where you can learn and grow and encourages learning and growth and um, not just for adults, but all ages, for children, the children to see and to learn from each other and to not, uh, you know, uh, see those differences um, that maybe the others of us see. Um, children are, are resilient. They're, they don't see color and, and, and different things sometimes, and I think it's nice to have that opportunity just to teach about cultures in general and embrace that cultural sensitivity. Just a couple of comments. The neighborhood get together sounds like a good option and the language practice as well. So that's certainly something that would work in libraries. That's a great idea. All right, do we have any 